the Florida Writer Podcast, a discussion about writing and other things. Hello and welcome to this edition of the Florida Writer Podcast. I'm your host, Allison Nissen, and today I am lucky enough to have with me Mark Newhouse. Mark, why don't you give me a 60-second elevator pitch about who you are and what you write? Well, thank you, Allison, for having me on. Uh, I am the youth chairperson for the Florida Writers Association and also co-chairperson for the conference for the youth program. And last year, I won the gold medal historical fiction for my book, The Devil's Bookkeepers. And it then went on to win the top prize of the year, which was the best published book of the Royal Palm Literary Awards. And nobody was more surprised than I was and and very, very grateful. Uh, The book, The Devil's Bookkeepers, is about the Holocaust ghetto in Poland that my mom and my father lived in and that they were among the few that miraculously survived. And so this book is extremely special to me. And I was never more honored and more thrilled than getting that award last year. Although one thing topped that even, and that was my son, got a silver award for the first book he ever did, which was about the Pulse Massacre. So it was an amazing, amazing night. So it was a family celebration. It, it, was, it was amazing. Yeah, it really was. And all I can say is that it's so gratifying, you know, to be a member of the Florida Rise Association and on the board of directors and to have this opportunity to have, you know, us struggling authors have a way of being recognized for our work. And to be recognized for a book about the Holocaust was just an incredible experience for me. So how did you react when they announced your name? Well, the funniest part about it was my son got his award first. So I thought that was so fantastic that I almost, I I was like congratulating him. And all of a sudden they announced that they were doing the, uh, the historical fiction. And so I was still busy, you know, felling, that means being feeling proud of him for his first book. And they said, well, third prize. And then they said, second prize. And I said, well, I guess I didn't win this year. And all of a sudden they announced first prize, you know, the gold award for the Devil's Bookkeepers. And I almost fell off my chair because I really didn't think that would happen. You know, It just shows you something because the year before I had entered the book in the RPLA and was a finalist, but didn't win anything. So when I got the judges' comments, I really learned from them and I rewrote the book, but I still didn't think it would do what it did this year. So I was absolutely thrilled and convinced me once again how important it is to learn from rejection and to be open to, you know, criticism because that really made a difference. I don't, think, uh, I don't think I could have really accomplished it without the judge's comments and suggestions. What was one of the suggestions that they had made that helped make the biggest difference? One of the biggest ones had to do with the fact that the book was about 500 pages long. And so one of the judges basically said that sort of sagged in the middle. Well, I reread the book and I said, you know what? I'm going to cut it in half. And that's exactly what I did. And after doing that, it eliminated all the sag. So that really made a big difference. I think the book turned out to be much, much better. And it also gave me a second book because what I did then was I took the second half of the book, rewrote it. And because I was kind of unsure of it, I submitted it to the Royal Palm Literary Awards and got a bronze medal as an unpublished manuscript. So that was a real surprise. So were you able to make adjustments to that and uh, to the second book? Oh, absolutely. I took the judge's comments. And I also, you know, I always uh, belonged to writer's clubs. uh, And I was reading parts of the book to them. And they also gave me tremendous help tremendous ideas on how to improve it. You know, I highly recommend belonging to a critique, a critique group and trusting them with your work because they gave me ideas that 
really were very, very helpful. You know, when I first joined a critique group, because I know you're not gonna believe this, but I'm, I'm shy, okay? Uh, as a child, I was abused and I was bullied. And so that's one of the reasons I think why I went into writing. So when I first joined the critique group and people started critiquing my work, I said, well, this is not for me. I didn't like being critiqued, but I've learned over the years that that's such an important element because before you put your book out there, you really have to have people read it and you have to be willing to learn from them and to listen. And that makes a big difference. They were a huge help to me. Now you had mentioned that your parents grew up in Poland. What was your childhood like? You said you were had been abused and bullied. So I imagine there's some interesting stories behind that. Yeah, someday I'll write my autobiography. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, my parents were Holocaust survivors from Ludge, Poland. And I was born in 1947, two years after the war. And if you read my book, you will see that I'm very lucky to be here. Because had I been born two years earlier, I would probably not be here. Uh, Ludge was established by the Nazis as a corral for 250,000 Jews. By the end of the war, which lasted, I guess, for the Ludge Ghetto about four years, less than 5,000 survived. Some people say less than 1,000 survived. Most were sent to the death camps by the end of the war. I don't know how my parents managed to survive. My mom was only five feet tall. Uh, she was a very petite woman. And her, she came from a large family, and she and one other brother and one sister were the only ones who survived. I never met my grandparents. And one of the things that I feel guilty about is that I lost their story of survival, which is one of the reasons why I spent such a long time and writing this book, because I knew almost nothing about what they, what they went through. Uh, by the end of, at near the end of the war, my mother was sent to Auschwitz and my father was sent there too, but he was fortunate because he was sent to a work camp in Buchenwald and they were liberated in January of 1945, about two years and one day before I was born. So when I was born, my mom was very sick and my father wanted to go to Israel, but unfortunately because of her being ill, they could not go to Israel. And instead, they came to the United States. They knew no one here. My father came with $5 in his pocket and just the will to survive and to, to be successful, which I hope is something I inherited from him. But he was a very abusive person. He was an only child. And he was very abusive. He, uh, he used to beat me, he used to beat her, and he used to beat my little brother. And I turned to writing because I was very lonely and basically because of the fact that I had a lot of problems as a child. And to me, the pen was like a magic wand. I could take, I could take a pen and create any world I wanted. And that's one of the reasons why I wrote children's books for so many years, and I still do. Tell me about the heroes in your children's stories. Well, that's interesting because in my children's books, I reverted back to my childhood. Uh, when I was a kid, one of my favorite programs was Perry Mason. And so I, I watched every Perry Mason episode. And for those of you who don't know, Perry Mason was a fictional lawyer who won every case. So I watched every Perry Mason episode and I read every Perry Mason book I could get my hands on. And I actually was gonna be a lawyer. But I became a teacher, and I had a wonderful, wonderful career. I actually have over 1,200 of my former sixth grade and fifth grade students on Facebook with me 20 years after I retired. And they still remember the crazy things I used to do in class. But one of the crazy things I would do is I would write plays for my uh, underperforming sixth grade students. And we put them on for the rest of the school and for the senior center. Well, in those plays, I would take a fairy tale like uh, Jack and the Beanstalk 
and I would create a mock trial. Well, after I retired, I said, you know, I think this would make a great series for kids. So I created a lawyer by the name of Jasper Dukevich, and I set him in a land of monsters and mythical folk called Monstrovia. He has a nephew named Brody, who's named after my grandson, and together they solve cases involving these monsters and fictional characters. And the first time I wrote the manuscript, I entered the Royal Palm Literary Awards, and we won first place with an unpublished manuscript. So it was a no-brainer, you know, to publish it. And that first book is called Welcome to Monstrovia. It won a silver medal in the Reader's Favorite Book Awards and also in the Benjamin Franklin Book Awards. So I guess it must be a fairly good book. I love it because it's funny. It's a page turner. I get letters from, from mothers who say now their children want to be lawyers. Uh, I believe kids need positive role models. Perry Mason was mine. Another one of my influences was Sherlock Holmes. And Brody is like the Watson to Jasper Dufinch's Sherlock Holmes. So the first book is about Jack and the Beanstalk. And Jack is put on trial for the murder of the giant. It's got so many funny twists, including the ending, that kids really love it. Uh, in the second book, which was called The Case of the Disastrous Dragon, a dragon is being evicted from his property. And that also was an RPLA winner. And the third book is called The Case of the Crazy Chicken Scratches. And that's based on one of my favorite stories of all time, which is a story about a man whose wife complains his house is very small and he brings all these animals into the house. And so she thinks he's crazy. Well, in my book, Jasper Dufinch and Brody have to decide if he's crazy and save him from all the different characters in Monstrovia that his animals are keeping awake at night, including Dracula. So there's a lot of craziness, a lot of fun. And the fourth book just recently came out, and that's called The Case of the Killer Knights. And I just entered that into the RPLA. So let's keep our fingers crossed with that. It's been an exciting experience. And I, if you ask me which I love better, writing for children or writing for adults, that's easy. I love writing for children, but I had to write the book about the Holocaust, partly out of guilt, because I couldn't tell my children and grandchildren and future generations what happened to their grandparents. And that really, really bothered me. Well, that is quite a motivation to put pen to paper. I, I tell people now, whenever I do a presentation, that one of the reasons why I do it is not because I want revenge on the Nazis or I want to tell people that, you know, that uh, this can happen again. But I tell people that they have stories. Everybody has a story. And I want people to preserve their story before they lose it. And I feel guilty that I lost the story of what happened to my mom. Years ago, my mom made a tape for Steven Spielberg's Shoah Foundation. I had had terrible nightmares as a child about the things I overheard my parents talking about uh, having to do with the concentration camps and with Auschwitz. And so I really did not want to hear more about Auschwitz and the rest of the terrible things that happened. It's a very common thing, by the way, that parents don't tell their children all the details of what happened. Anyway, my mom made the tape and I put it in a closet and it was, stayed there for about five years. And then one day my younger son came home from college and he said to me he had an assignment to do. And he asked me a question. He said, Dad, he said, weren't your parents in the Holocaust? I thought to myself, how can you not know that? And that was my fault. So together we sat down and we watched my mother's tape. And to be very honest with you, my mother had forgotten a lot of what, you know, happened to her. And she was also kind of circumspect about what she was telling people. Uh, it was a graduate student interviewing her when it should have been me. And that's another thing I felt guilty about. Anyway, 
she said one sentence in the tape that really got to me. And I took that sentence and I wrote a story for a contest. And because there was a deadline for the contest, I didn't interview my mom before I submitted the story. And that was a huge mistake, one that I usually don't make. And what happened was the story won the contest. And one of the judges' sheets came back and it, it said that they loved the story. It was a haunting story, but they didn't put it that way. They said, this is a haunting work of fiction. But it wasn't fiction. At least I didn't want it to be. I didn't show my mom the story for about two years, and I didn't show it to any of my relatives because I was kind of ashamed that I had fictionalized this story. Well, about two years later, uh, we were going out to visit my mom who was living in Miami, and I decided to bring the book with me that the story appeared in. And my wife, who's a sweetheart, said to me, you know, don't do it, don't give it to mom. And so I wasn't going to, but the last hour that I was there, I decided to give it to her. And when I got home, and I said to her, Ma, I'm sorry this isn't exactly what it should be. I'm going to come down in a month, and I'll interview you. But I'd like you to read it. When I, by the time I got home, my mother called me up and said, you know, Mark, she said, I love the story. It's a wonderful story. But I wish you'd asked me about it before you wrote it. I would have told you the truth of what happened. Anyway. I told her I would come down a month later, and we made an appointment. And about two days before I was ready to go down, I got a phone call from my stepfather, who's also a concentration camp survivor, but very, very different than my dad. A, a wonderful, wonderful man. And he told me my mom was in the hospital. And I had to hurry down to Miami. So we drove down to Miami, and I got there 10 minutes after she passed away. And I lost that story. Now, what was the sentence that got my interest? It was that my mom may have saved her family from being sent to Auschwitz until the end of the uh, Holocaust by working in a warehouse. And what she was doing was running her hand flat over clothing, over pockets, seams, and finding things in the pockets and turning it over to the German overseers. Where was the clothing coming from? It was coming from the death camps. I lost that story and there was no way I could ever make up for it. All the survivors of the Holocaust are passing very, very quickly. And so I've been trying as much as I can to preserve what happened in the Ludge Ghetto, which is why I wrote my books. I must tell you that um, I wrote the first Devil's Bookkeeper's book, which I said was about 500 or so pages in 30 days, but it took me three years to release it. And why? Because I wanted to make sure that I, I was authentic in my descriptions. So I researched probably about 2,000 photographs that were taken in the Ludge Ghetto by two men who were risking their lives to take those photographs. A lot of them were taken through holes in the coat pocket. And this is how I got the background details for my book. And what makes me very, very proud is that people are telling me how real the books seem and how emotionally involved they are in the books. People tell me they can't go to sleep at night because they have to continue reading. It's been, it was emotionally draining for me to write them, but to get this kind of response has been incredible, absolutely incredible. What a wonderful legacy you have left for the survivors of the Holocaust. Mark, how can people get in touch with you or find the book? Well, the easiest way to find the book is on Amazon and Kindle. And now there are three books. People who read book two told me, and I thought it was ending there, they asked me to write what happened to the characters. 
because the characters seem so real to them. So I had to write book three, and it is now on Kindle and on Amazon and getting, again, rave reviews, which is so gratifying to me. But what's really gratifying to me is the emotional response that the books are receiving. In fact, uh, this week, uh, book two was number one in all of Jewish literature on Kindle. And all three books have been in the top 100 of all the categories on Kindle. So I'm hoping they will make a difference to people and people will learn, you know, what really happened. People know about the Warsaw Ghetto, but they don't know about Ludge. And Ludge was headed by a man who I think is one of the most interesting and controversial figures in history. To reach me, the easiest way is through my publishing company, which is now headed by my son, Keith, uh, www.newhousecreativegroup.com. That's all one word. Use the contact form and I'll be happy to get in touch with you. Uh, the books are available on Kindle and on Amazon and will soon be everywhere where quality books are sold. Uh, the Monstrovia books are actually being developed for a film series or for a television series. So keep your fingers crossed because I like nothing more than having, than hearing children laugh and being excited while they learn. That to me is the greatest feeling on earth. All right, Mark, this has been a wonderful interview. Are you ready to switch gears to our rapid fire questions? Anything you want, I'll be happy to answer. Question number one, do you like thunderstorms? You know, <laughs> I actually do love thunderstorms, but as a child, they terrified me because they sound like my father shouting. Oh boy. How about mountains or beach? Definitely the beach, and especially with my wonderful wife. All right, and the last question, what is your favorite guilty pleasure? That's legal. I my favorite guilty pleasure? Oh boy. Watching Married at First Sight. <laughs> that to anybody, but it always makes me feel so good about my marriage. I married Linda, who is a Brit, on the 4th of July. And I always tell people that if she had been a general in the English Army, we'd still be a colony. I also tell them. Uh, that married, marrying her on the 4th of July, I lost my independence, but it's been fireworks ever since. Oh, that's a beautiful tribute to your, to your lovely bride. So, I'm very Mark, blessed. <laughs> Mark, thank you so much for stopping by. It's been my pleasure. I really enjoyed myself. Thank you. You all have been listening to another edition of the Florida Writer Podcast with your host, Allison Nissen. Allison out. Mark Newhouse's novel, The Devil Bookkeepers One, about the Holocaust ghetto his parents miraculously survived, won the gold medal, historical fiction, and top honor best published book of the year from the Florida Writers Association. A retired New York school teacher, New York State Reading Association Teacher of the Year, and now the chairperson of the Florida Writers Youth Program. He is also an FWA director. For more information about Mark, visit his author page on Amazon or newhousecreativegroup.com. For more information about the Florida Writers Association, visit us at floridawriters.net.